in a four-year period, I lied to Lori at least a thousand times, and that caused trauma when she found out about it. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Coffee with the Couple Cure. I'm Jay. And I'm Lori. Welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking about a specific issue. It's uh, what we do during our day job. Today, we're going to be covering the question, can betrayal be traumatic? Now, if you know anything about our story, you know that there was a lot of betrayal in our marriage. And mm-hmm. we can kind of yeah, that was, <laughs> that was through uh, hidden porn use, through considering affairs, and through a lot of lying. And in a four-year period, I lied to Lori at least a thousand times, and that caused trauma when she found out about it. Right. Um, and just to kind of as a side note, if you don't believe that porn is addictive, if you don't believe that it can affect relationships, then do a quick internet search with the terms, fight the new drug, who is uh, misrepresenting science? Fight the new drug, who is misrepresenting science? That will lead you to a page of study after study on the effects of porn, not just on the individual using it, but also on the relationships. Yeah. So with that being said, I guess we'll just jump right in. Again, this is what we do during our day job. Uh, and what we do is address the trauma of betrayal, not just on the individual who was betrayed, but also the disruption that it creates within the relationship. Yeah. Now, it was once thought that codependency or co-addiction were the only things that affected a person Uh, who was involved with somebody with an addiction. Now they're finding, though, that trauma, when they treat it from a trauma approach, it's much more effective. What I've seen in my own life, what I've seen in a lot of the lives of the ladies we work with, is if you tell them, hey, you're codependent, they will go to town working on their codependency, and they'll actually kind of do a really good job. It will help in the other areas of their lives, maybe with their coworkers or children or uh, other family members, but within the marriage relationship, it doesn't quite work. And what they're finding is, is because it doesn't work because the issue isn't the codependency, it's the addiction. Right. It's feeling, well, I think it's feeling unsafe because when someone comes out with an addiction, the, you know, I kept it hidden for four years. So how is Lori going to know? Has he returned to it? I wasn't in an addiction where you could tell by the bank account being depleted or by there being beer bottles all over the house or, you know, use needles somewhere. Yeah. There, you know, there was no way for her to check. And so... Every day was, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? And I didn't know how to answer that question for her at the beginning. So when you live in a consistently unsafe environment, that's when you can develop PTSD. It's not just big traumas that create PTSD, uh, which can happen, but it's the little traumas. It's the consistently feeling unsafe. Right. And because of the lies, because of my hidden life, it was really hard for her to know whether or not she's safe. It's really hard for our clients uh, to know whether or not their husband has started using again. So this creates kind of the over-processing in their, in their head about mm-hmm. what's going on, and um, it, it can create a lot of, a lot of disturbance for them. Another issue we'll be getting into are the anger issues that came along with it. And that was probably the most difficult thing to navigate within our own marriage. One of the first things I wrote was, I hope we can talk about it this time. Right. And right off the bat, I realized we couldn't. And uh, because he was very resistant, very blame shifty and yeah. uh, that sort of thing. And this was coming... By the time I felt like something was off and I confronted him, I thought he had like 10 years of sobriety. He had gotten so good at lying. I was telling him, look, I don't think you need to talk about it like your issue anymore. I think you're 
one of the 10 to 20 percent of the guys who don't use it because that's what the study the latest study was um, they showed that 80 to 90 percent of the guys consistently used uh, pornography so I told him you know you're one of the 10 or 20 percent and then well and during that time we were also getting a, along fairly well I mean we weren't super connected but we also weren't having explosive angry outbursts right and then once this came out, oh my gosh, it's like he completely changed. He went back to the person that I had seen earlier when we dealt with this. So yeah. that was an issue as well. Um, and on the anger issue, we've seen it probably about 98% of the time. Mm -hmm. The guy has, once he's found out, he has a major problem with controlling himself when it comes to angry outbursts. Right. Um, even if it's fairly latent, all the years prior, yeah. there's something about this issue that just brings out this like kind of entitlement in. Uh, well, it, I don't know that it's entitlement toward anger. I think that anger is a cover emotion to how it Im impacts their identity, how it impacts. Um, the the beliefs about themselves and and having to confess lying to my wife a thousand times doesn't make me look good and so when Lori would bring it up I didn't want to talk about that anymore this is like no agreeing with you means I'm a horrible person and I never thought that <laughs> well but but in my head I you know in using the pornography in and the shame that I lived under, and I know that there are people that use porn without shame, but I lived under shame because of it. And this self-loathing that I already lived with, mm -hmm. Lori kept touching on, you know, there's a good reason for you to dislike yourself. You lied to me a thousand times. And that's not what she was saying, <laughs> but that's what my ears were hearing. That's what I kept hearing, and that's what I kept fighting against. I didn't want to own this identity that I was a liar, that I chose me over Lori, that I loved something else more than her. And that's really um, hard for the guys to take. I think that's part of it. I think... Um, you know, the other part of it is feeling so out of control. I've I've gone from using my numbing medication yeah, to not having it, yeah. and now I'm feeling all these things kind of at with the volume at 11. I really can't turn it down anymore. And um, Lori was fairly intense. You know, she wanted mm -hmm. the pain for herself to stop, and the door was open, so she came at me with a lot of intensity. And... You know, she wanted to feel safe, make me, you know, help me mm -hmm. feel safe, help me feel safe. And that intensity, of course, you know, was overwhelming as well. So in the overwhelm, I would react negatively instead of saying, OK, I can just let this wash over me. Somehow it just kept dragging, you know, this this part of me out. And until I could fully own it. I kept showing up really awful yeah so that's part of the trauma and it's actually we're way off yeah we're way <laughs> off base right now but that is part of it if you look at the damage that comes from all this as a triangle pointing up if you cut it into thirds the top part the smallest part is the pornography me like a lot of the women I talked to were like I can handle the pornography as long as we can talk about it, as long as he's honest about it. The second part, the, the middle part, is the lying in the hidden life. That starts creating problems, but the everything else, the anger issues, the blame shifting, the societal stuff that comes at us, uh, the horrible, horrible things that are said about us or about our bodies, uh, which can be kind of common those that's also that last piece is what causes the greatest amount of trauma but when it comes to just the betrayal what research is finding is that um like well th what therapists are finding is anywhere from 70 to 98 percent 
of their clients who come in after just porn use have clinical signs of PTSD. Not all of them do. In fact, I would think the ones that would never have PTSD from this would never even go to therapy. I mean, I've talked to one woman, it's probably in our in the mid range of our, our years together. I remember talking to one woman who said, I'm glad he's got porn because I don't want him climbing all over me mm. at night. Right. So Or or they just leave. They're like, Nope, not gonna stay for all this right. and they leave and they don't have the PTSD because they're not in the constant cycle of mm -hmm. am I safe or not? You know. And that brings up something I want to talk about at another time um, because I thought that that was my that would have proven that I had self-esteem and it actually proved something different so we'll cover that in another episode right. so 70 to 98 percent of the people of the women who show up in therapy have clinical signs of PTSD right. what they're also finding at least what I'm finding is in my life, I took 15 years to work on having more faith or uh, working on my codependency, but that didn't fix it here. In fact, that gave us a relationship that ended up where we were. Right. So I told God, if I'm staying, I've got to do something differently. And so we did, only to land and find the trauma model so what took me 15 years now working with the trauma model, I can get a woman there like to the same spot that took me 15 years. I can get her there in about four months. Now that's if we like kind of stay focused and there's not a whole lot of weekly yeah. relationship disruption, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. And it can be done in a way that really heals her versus kind of puts her on this never-ending cycle of it's right. me, no, it's him, no, it's me, no, it's him. It really puts things into place and helps her realize, oh, this is important, this is traumatic, I need to take this seriously, and with the other approach, we can actually help her to do that. Yeah, and I, so something that just dawned on me there is all of the other approaches tell the woman you need to fix you instead of... Yeah, this problem is because you need to fix you. Yeah, you need to fix you in the relationship. Going in and saying, hey, you know what? I just found out my husband's been carrying a secret for the last four years. For the helping person to respond with, well, you need to fix you and that won't happen anymore is crap. I mean, well, <laughs> yeah. I would like to use a stronger term, but that's crap because... I, I intentionally lied to Lori to keep my secrets hidden. It wasn't because she wasn't fixed. It was because I wasn't fixed. She ended up being wounded. She ended up being torn apart by my lies. So for someone to come to her and say, well, I'm sorry that you're bleeding out here on the ground, but you need to fix you and then everything will be okay. You know, your husband needs to fix himself, yes, Kind of, you know, sort of, but you really need to fix you so that you can handle this. Right. And, and I, that's com completely uh, unhelpful as far as what we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, which brings up a couple of things that we need to discuss in another episode or another couple episodes. Uh, those two things being the codependent model versus the trauma model and also uh, treatment-induced trauma, and what I have termed uh, treatment-endorsed trauma, which can, well, we'll get into that later. Um, anyway, for the purposes of this work, I take this approach, or we take this approach. The mm -hmm. trauma of betrayal occurs when someone has frequent or intense feelings of being unsafe when their partner turns outside the marriage for a relationship or, or for sex. If it happens often enough, it can cause PTSD. And it's not just when their partner turns outside the marriage for relationship or uh, sex. It's also if there's other betrayals to the point where you feel unsafe. Um, this goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and all that kind of stuff. But that's the synopsis of what we base our work on. 
anyway, you want to wrap up for today or? Uh, there's actually one more okay. thing that I'd like to talk about. And that's about uh, the pushback that has been seen in the, uh, the professional community when it comes to the betrayal trauma model. There have been many professionals who've misunderstood this, um, thinking that it just creates victims. You're going to do nothing but create victims. And what I've seen is, no, um, it keeps, th it, it gets them more quickly on a path of becoming a victor in their own life. Right. And hopefully the guy will um, realize she's getting stronger and realize she could leave and will then start taking his own recovery and his own anger issues seriously. Right. So I don't promote women playing the victim. The act, you know, the opposite is true. Right. I promote them in finding real solutions, ones that aren't going to keep her spinning for 15 years. Right. The and trauma model gets to the heart of the matter and addresses it, where the actual the woman is actually able to make progress more quickly and more completely. Right. And honestly, what I've seen is <laughs> most of the guys... Um, not really complain, but they become aware that their wives have found a voice, that their wives have become stronger people. And that's when things can go crazy bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, that's when things can, they can get off track off the because the guys want to. Um, in some. Yeah. In some cases, they want to stay on top. You know, if they're narcissistic to begin with, mm -hmm. they want to stay in control. And for other guys, it's just confusing. They've gone from a, from a more, not really passive wife, but a, a wife that was more quiet to a wife that's now telling them straight up certain things that they don't want to hear. And for some of those guys, it's a bit challenging, but we, you know, that's where I come in is helping them to deal with that. Right. And helping the guy to see how... You know, your your wife didn't get hit by a bus because she was standing in the middle of the road. She got hit by a bus because you tracked her down and ran her over. <laughs> and um, we now need to heal the damage, heal the wound, as opposed to tell her everything that's wrong with her, why she was standing in front of a bus. Yeah, and and maybe maybe track her down is kind of a harsh word. But the, the vision I got... Um, during one of my processing times with, um, with God was, I felt like Jay was on a party bus and he was at the wheel and it was just filled with beautiful porn stars. And out of his distraction, he ran me over. And then in order to shut me up, he backed up and ran me over again. And so anytime I talked, he'd back up and run me over again. So not fun. But getting back to the pushback, some of the time, what will happen is a woman might be called bipolar, or not bipolar, uh, a person with borderline personality disorder, because her emotions are all over the map. But then mm -hmm. you have to look at the home life. What is it like? Is she being talked to? Is she being treated well? Is it this, I'll get better and I'll stop treating you horribly? And then he treats her horribly and then I'll get better and stop treating you horribly. And then he gets, you know, and then he um, treats her horribly again. And then you also have to understand that she's not out of the woods yet. She's not out of the war yet. Society, right. you know, there's so many images that remind her of the trauma right. that can have her all over the map emotionally. Right. Yeah, we'll so. get into that, I think, more deeply. But yeah. Basically, for for our healing years, Lori was sleeping with the enemy. She never knew mm -hmm. if she could trust me, or she didn't know she could trust me until I rebuilt trust. And so her fears, her very legitimate fears, would come and go moment to moment based on, you know, where I was, what I was seeing, all those kind of things. So. Yeah. Yeah, so very legitimate stuff. Wow, we went long on this one. Um, so can betrayal be traumatic? Yes. And 
the approach, the best approach is the trauma model. In my opinion, it's what I've seen work so quickly with women. Very, very high success rate, at least in my mm -hmm. experience, about a 98% success rate. Yeah. Uh, so it's very effective. And it, it helps her to know, I might not be able to trust him, but I certainly can trust myself. And me and my higher power, for me, that was God. Me and God working together, I'm going to be okay. So. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye.